Hi, everyone. Hola a todos. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jorge Molina. I'm the programming coordinator for La Leaf. Uh, and thanks so much for coming uh, to La Leaf Connect, a, power, a festival powered by the Latino Film Institute, dedicated to celebrating Latinx experiences through art, film, TV, music, and the digital space. And thanks all for uh, coming to the panel for our amazing shorts program three uh, and all the filmmakers that are here with us. Uh, I just want to give, uh, before we start uh, the, the panel, just a shout out to everyone that's that's um, with us. So once you hear your name, just like wave. Uh, from the short plains in St. Mueller, we have Nicolas Botana and Lucia Moreira. Uh, from Flowers Within, we have uh, Cata Loret and Gabriela Ortega. From Maria, uh, we have uh, Zoe Salicru. Uh, from Flesh, uh, Camila K. Cater. Uh, from Borrachero, uh, Gustavo Cerquera. From Habitografía Dos, we have Monica Bravo, um, Miguel Bojorquez, and Álvaro Girón. And from La Casita Rosa, we have Elvin Herrera. Hey, so I'm very excited to be talking to all of you. Uh, right now, I'm going to ask everyone to magically disappear and uh, just uh, the team from uh, Blazins and Mueller to stay with me. Ooh, see everyone disappear. Hi, guys. Uh, Hi. Thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you. So, of course. Thank you. Uh, so I'm. Uh, my first question is, uh, what was the initial spark for the idea for the short and how did that grow into into the story we see. What was the first element that kind of came to you guys about all this? Nicolas, do you want to? Well, first, I don't speak English. So Lucia <laughs> is my I Google try translate. To translate. <laughs> Exacto. Este, bueno, la idea inicial, yo cuando suelo pensar ideas para realizar algún tipo de guión, por ejemplo, eh, lo que hago es unir dos o tres conceptos que tengo, que son independientes, y que en determinado momento eh, Bueno, busco la forma de unirlos. En este caso fue eh, la idea de filmar algo en mi casa. Yo en este momento estoy en el apartamento, este es el set de filmación del cortometraje. Ahí está la ventana que aparece en un momento. Aprendí la lección de que nunca más voy a filmar nada dentro de mi casa. Pero bueno, esa fue la idea por razones de economía y bueno, por tener el apartamento a disposición. Y la segunda idea fue una escena de otro cortometraje anterior donde uno de los personajes eh, contaba la historia de un sujeto que ponía un churrasco en, en, en el microondas para calentar y el churrasco salía cada vez más crudo porque había como un portal en el tiempo en ese microondas. Era una escena nomás que una historia que contaba un personaje entonces uní estos dos elementos, decir, bueno eh, ¿qué pasaría con ese personaje si continuara su historia? Y bueno, y filmarla dentro de mi apartamento. Esos fueron los dos elementos. Ok, I will tell something because he yeah. too much. So he starts working with two concepts that um, he, like, uh, through his life is adding up and putting together into his new stories. Blanis Mueller is one of that, that uh, unites two concepts. One of them is one of the a previous short film that is about a... Uh, piece of meat that runs through time and it, it, it stays raw. And the other one is the one thing and also something that we talked about that it was uh, to, sh to film the, the, to shoot the short film in a, a limited space that is his apartment, what is he now? And that's the set film. Yeah, that's so my Blanes yeah. Street and Mueller is my address, in fact. Yeah, in real life. <laughs> oh, brave of you yeah, to just put it out the window, there. <laughs> that's the window that appears on the short film. When awesome. the, the Jorge 1 and Jorge 2 come yeah, together Jorge and two. talk. <laughs> uh, speaking of Jorge 1 and Jorge 2, uh, I'd love uh, for you guys to tell me how I was working with actors and especially with someone who basically has to portray uh, two versions of the same character. Like, what are the conversations that you guys have with him to help him uh, prepare and, and reach that? Yes. Okay. Eh, bueno. Sí, es un, es una, un actor con quien yo ya había trabajado antes. Bueno, justamente the previous actor with him, he already worked with. So he had the, the experience already. Exacto. Y bueno, fue mu mucha conversación, más que nada. Eh, nosotros ya hemos trabajado, entonces ya nos conocemos. Y bueno, fue conversando con él 
aprobando, él me sugería cosas, íbamos viendo, y bueno, una cosa que, que habíamos arreglado es que eh, como el personaje viaja a través de un microondas, una cosa medio rara, un portal en el tiempo, que le va generando como una especie de lastimadura en el rostro, entonces pensamos que tenía que ser un personaje un poco sufrido, y de hecho, bueno, Lucía va a hablar un poco ahora, porque en, en, el, en el rodaje, en la vida real, él eh, al tercer día de rodaje más o menos, empezó a sentir unos dolores muy fuertes en la espalda, que no se podía mover en un momento, y el rodaje estuvo suspendido. Entonces una, una frase que él me dijo fue, eh, voy a utilizar este dolor para componer el personaje. Entonces sí. terminó siendo un elemento que jugó a favor, digamos, en el momento del rodaje. Claro, claro. Yes. So the, the, the actor that plays the, the principal character was in, hurt, was in pain through the, the whole shooting of the short film. It was like a back pain, and it, he himself said that he was going to use that pain to, to mm -hmm. uh, enrich the character, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the whole interpretation. And it was good with that part, but on the other hand, it stopped the, the shooting for almost a day, and we were like running through the doctor and, and going back and forth, <laughs> knowing with the AD, Telling, telling, telling her that what, what are we going to do with this? And that was kind of uh, experience. <laughs> yeah, well, it, the pain definitely shined through in the short. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we will have you guys back at the end, but uh, thank okay. you guys for being here. And uh, now thank I'd you. love the team uh, Flowers Within and Flora Centro to join me. Hi. Uh, Gabriela and Kata. Um, so I'd love for you to tell me what was, this is a story that you guys created together. Uh, what was the first conversation that you had uh, that kind of was the, the seed, uh, the, the seed of this flower that became the short? Sorry, I needed to make that pun. <laughs> no bad. Um, I'm Gabriela, I'm the writer. Um, so Kata and I are friends in real life which was made it super easy and delightful to start working together. Um, and we were literally in my living room being like, let's make a short. And the first question was, what makes us angry about being a woman sometimes and, and our upbringing and, and what makes us upset and what do we want to say? Um, and what was beautiful about that conversation was that we started talking about our own personal experiences, which to me is like the most Uh, honest storytelling um, and what was great was that and also kind of like incredible is that our experiences even though she's from Merida and I'm from Dominican Republic were very similar we both struggled with the way we had to look all the time and the standard felt so attached to our value as people and like it was so high and and also how complicated our first female friendships were because we were always pinned against each other and there was this sense of competition everywhere we go And so the beautiful, the way that we wanted to translate it in, into the, the film was like, how do we make this into a visual moment, you know, rather than just like that, how do we translate those feelings? And so that's when like, we were throwing ideas about like, oh, I feel like a horse blindsided whenever I'm so focused on the way I look, or like, I wish someone would look at what's inside of me and it's like, a zipper coming down and it's all flowers or like I wanted to curl out of my skin and so I think that was the most I think that the whole process started very organic and, and, and hence it's all about flowers and nature. No of course and and that really uh, comes through uh, and I mean part of the thing that makes the short so, like so great is just how there are so many different elements working together. Uh, I'd love to hear more about how the collaboration between, you know, the music, the editing, the, the animated sequences, like how did you collaborate with uh, those other people uh, so that this vision you're talking about kind of was, was able to be uh, told and, and get across? Well, this film, I feel like it's truly a film about collaboration because all these individual parts, not only my story and Gabriela's story, but everyone else, Um, really, uh, it, they were people that I, most of them I met last year. And so it was a very beautiful way to, to collaborate with new people that all each, I feel like their elements really made the whole story come together. 
one of the key people was uh, Vicente Manzano, the editor, and, and he did also the photography for the short. And collaborating with him from the beginning, telling, because I knew he was going to edit, uh, coming up with the way we wanted to design the shots, um, the framing of it all. And then through him, I met the composer, Juan, uh, which is a friend of him. And he, uh, they both, um, that process of making the music was more of them. And mm -hmm. it was really amazing to see how they both created the score for the film. For, for the film. And, and then also later that year, uh, I went to a film festival with Vicente as well in Seattle. And that's where I met Morning, the animator. And with her, the process was very organic. We developed like a language of the eyes, for example. And, and she, I just let her do her thing after talking about the themes because what is really, like Gabriela said, it's very prevalent, these things that as women we feel, regardless of culture, morning is from China, we are from Latin America. And so these themes keep showing up everywhere. And so working, collaborating with other women was very easy because they got it right away. And then with the men, they also understood because they they see what's going on and, and, and they also know um, maybe you need to talk about more about your experience because they maybe didn't feel it, but, but it was a very um, cool process of each creative um, bringing in their own, their own style and their own voice to, to really uplift the whole project. Yeah, and the final, yeah, like you said, it really is a product of collaboration. Uh, well, thanks so much for joining. Uh, we'll have you guys uh, back at the end, but uh, in the meantime, I would like to have uh, the team of Maria, Zoe, join me. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm good, thank you. Um, so my question for you is, uh, how did you decide what the angle into your story was and why this specific character was the story you wanted to tell? Um, the, yeah, I guess. So, I mean, uh, mental health is, is, has always been a pretty big priority in, in my life. And I just feel like, you know, whether it's on screen or day to day, mm -hmm. we just don't talk enough about it. And, um, on it, I think it's important to just, uh, kind of destigmatize, um, mental health, uh, it's 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 very much something that everybody deals with whether they want to accept it or not and i think the more we talk about it the more you know mm -hmm. we can normalize it and kind of be open to each yeah, other's experience on a on a personal level um i spent uh hurricane maria here in new york so i was very mm -hmm. much part of the puerto rican diaspora kind of um, looking from very far away at everything that was happening in Puerto Rico during the hurricane and after the hurricane. And um, it's, you know, I always stress how it's, it's never going to compare to the people that were actually in Puerto okay. Rico enduring the, the natural catastrophe. Um, but you, you still felt a sense of helplessness. And in, in my personal experience, I had someone very close to me who had been um, dealing with mental health issues um, for a, a big part of their lives. And um, I couldn't reach them for, you know, almost a month. So I found myself being pushed to the edge, just um, wondering, you know, what happened and, and kind of expecting the worst. So that, that led me to kind of start this, like, you know, personal investigation on like, well, if this is happening to me, like I can mm -hmm. only imagine there's many other people going mm -hmm. through that who's monitoring this and how are we dealing with it and to my surprise there there wasn't very much mm -hmm. um studies being um you know taking taking place and um that to me was alarming mm -hmm. um because the little information i was able to find was already you know incredibly um surprising how the the suicide rates had spiked up and that was only the first months after the hurricane. And the more I started to dig into the investigation, I found out that after natural catastrophes, um, underserved communities will, will show real signs of, of mental health deterioration mm -hmm. six months to a year after um, the catastrophe has happened. So 
automatically that just, you know, got me going in terms of like, I, I must, you know, make something about it. I thought, you know, there were so many wonderful other films that tackled kind of the physical aspect of yeah. the hurricane. Um, but I just, I felt like this was a very important angle that, that needed to be, uh, kind of put out there. And yeah, so, no. yeah. And I'm, I'm personally driven by, um, narratives, um, that unpack the humanity behind, um, Latinx women. So it was kind of a given that I wanted to explore this sense of loss through this young woman's eyes. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it, you know, and it's, I think what's um, what kind of uh, makes me a little moves me in in a in an interesting way is how this goes obviously beyond hurricanes like any yeah. natural catastrophe you know and and obviously beyond Puerto Rico but if we're going to talk about Puerto Rico like we you know they were stricken with earthquakes um, earlier this year. And you could just tell how that triggered them yep. um, automatically to, oh my God, what does this mean? And even what we're enduring right now with the pandemic, like it, it goes back to the same situation of like, what does a group of people do when they experience unemployment, lack of electricity, lack mm -hmm. of water, and just lack of, of government support and not enough resources when it comes to their mental health. So it's, it's an ongoing situation. And I think we should just definitely continue to talk about it. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, what, I mean, you said it, it this is a, a, a film that kind of explores it that narratively. It's not a documentary. It's not, it, it focuses more on, on the narrative side. What do you think uh, like narrative film can help or in what ways narrative film versus like documentary can help bring awareness to these overlooked communities and yeah it's, the first time, yeah, it's the first time I do that where I couple mm -hmm. kind of like narrative film with facts. Um, I mean, narrative is is my uh, kind of um, first choice in terms mm -hmm. of like what I gravitate when I want to tell a story. But I also feel um, like I have a little bit more of um, room to play with emotions and really create mm -hmm. an experience for you to put yourself in this character's shoes and and kind of show you a world that um, that is is accurate. You know, I am I am depicting reality, but I can also um, experiment with different emotions um, that I just feel like through narrative I can um, get a, targeted a little bit more than if it was documentary. So you know, in this particular case, I didn't want it to do a lot of dialogue. I wanted you mm -hmm. to experience what it was like to feel for months and months on end, um, the sound of the, the power plants outside. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I only wish there was a way for me to transmit the fumes that you would actually continue to breathe for months and months on end and how all of that can, can affect you. So being able to really go in there and, um, and hyper focus on those little details. I felt like I could do it justice with with a narrative as opposed to um, a different medium. But I thought I thought it was still important to show those statistics at the end. No, for sure. Kind of taking you through an experience and then kind of presenting to you what that community in particular uh, went through and continues to go through. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank you so much and congratulations for, for the film and uh, I will see you in a little bit. Okay. Uh, now I'd love to have uh, Camila from uh, Flash join me right now. Hi. Hi, Camila. Hello. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, so this short depicts the stories of, of various women. Uh, my, my question is, how did you find them and how did you decide like what, what what kind of stories you wanted to tell? Were there, like, did you have to pick from within a group or how did you decide on, on these particular stories? Okay. So uh, this film, uh, Carney, was structured uh, in five chapters. Uh, we had this ironic association between the meat cooking points and the women's phase of life. So uh, from that, I created some profiles for, for, for each protagonist, each chapter. Uh, each character, and then uh, we did a lot of research to find those women. We uh, released a form online, 
and we also had some indications from friends. And we interviewed uh, six women, and we we kept uh, five of them. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, for the first uh, protagonist, uh, the the profile would be uh, some uh, someone who has been fat during childhood, and uh, uh, this was the, the profile. So the story we we didn't know yet. Yeah. Um, uh, only after the interview. So. Oh, that, that's that's really fascinating. Uh, and another uh, aspect that I really love about that, uh, or the way that the story unfolds, is just how every single segment has a different form of animation. Uh, some of it's uh, motion, um, stop motion, a little bit more like watercolor. Like, what, what, how did you come to make that decision of using a different style of animation for every segment? Uh, so originally, the film was supposed to be in two D digital, black and white. But after interviewing the first character, I changed my mind. So she was telling her story uh, about uh, her mother being a nutritionist and all these regulations um, concerning food. So I thought maybe I could try uh, to experiment with real food, maybe painting on a plate. And I think uh, and that's what I did. And the, the challenge was to do the same with the next protagonist yeah, because uh -huh. we did in the first one the, the first protagonist was really the first one. and also i think that uh, using different mediums also bring a, a, a sensorial a sensorial dimension to the film and each chapter was animated by a different animator mm -hmm. as well. so um, for example the premenopause phase uh, we used we, we choose to use clay. Mm -hmm. She's talking about her body uh, that is changing on this phase. So we, uh, I wanted to, to have a technique that matched the, uh, with the with the story. Sorry. Yeah, it, it was really beautiful. I enjoyed it so much, and uh, yeah. thank you for thank joining you so us. Um, thank you. Uh, right now, I'd love uh, Gustavo from Borrachero to to join me. Hey. Hi, how are you? Pretty good. Good. Uh, so my question for you is, um, this is really cool. We have a lot of animation here. Uh, why, why did you think animation was the best form of telling this story? Like, did it come from that? Or uh, was the story for like, why, why animation for this? Uh, the easy answer is that I'm an animator. So... <laughs> So that's, it's kind of my wheelhouse, right? But mm -hmm. uh, I've always kind of like flirted with the idea of like live action, uh, mm -hmm. working with live action, um, doing short films or like, yeah, something. So I think this was like a good opportunity to actually kind of mix a bit of both my interest in animation, a bit like kind of a bit live action. So in terms of process of what I did was I actually, you know, like I shot live footage Mm -hmm. And then I painted frame by frame that footage and turned it into like these like animated digital painting. And then I, after doing that, I turned it in, I actually processed it in a 3D animation software. So I turned something that was, yeah, like live footage. I kind of like shot it. So I went, I did location scouting. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm from Colombia, but I live in Canada. So I went to Colombia. I did like, I travel around, I shot all this footage. And then I came back and I turned it into an animation. Um, so I think what, what what I like about that process, it's super time consuming and I do not recommend it for anyone because it's really silly, but um, it's something like you don't know exactly what I, how I see it is like, you, it's not quite 2D animation, it's not quite 3D animation and it's not quite live footage. So, so there's a blurring of like the technique. It's like this weird hybrid technique and I think that kind of like makes, uh, represent is well reflected in the narrative because the narrative is also a bit kind of fantastical and psychedelic, yeah. uh, but it's kind of also grounded on like these kind of like somewhat real stories in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. Colombia. So like there's also like the blurring of like what's real and what's fantasy or what's me maybe memory and what's uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, or fact and fiction, that, that, that kind of blurring of the thing. So I think that that worked well with 
with the theme and with the process as well. So. Yeah, no, it de definitely did. Um, and for, I mean, one of the, my favorite aspects of it and one of the most I, I described as kind of a bit haunting uh, is the score and the music that's playing above. It, it almost serves almost, almost like dialogue and like, you know, that's, that's how the story's told. Uh, how, uh, how was the conversation you had with the music department? Like at what point did they come in? Uh, and, and how did that conversation go to, to choose the sound of the film? Right. So there's no there's no music department. Like it's just mainly me. Yeah. But uh, the music is uh, from a French ambient, like drone ambient musician called mm -hmm. Hinterheim. So you know, the music was made, like wasn't made for the film. Um, oh, that's but, really interesting. Yeah, I know. So, but it's a funny, weird story because yeah. uh, I was making this film. It, it took me so long to complete because it, it was just taking me forever. And I was actually supposed to initially collaborate with a friend of mine who's a musician. Mm -hmm. And we had this plan like two years ago, we were going to collaborate on this. He was like on board, whatever. I just got delayed on, on this process. And then I was making this and I didn't want to give him anything that was like, like I wanted to give him like a rough draft of the animation. So I was listening to a lot of like Johan Johansson's uh, soundtrack mm -hmm. for like yeah. Andy and Arrival. And I wanted something like that ambient and drone. So like I was, I was a fine fan of Hinterheim. And I knew his work and so just like oh like you know let, let me just put this here for now and then I kind of build the animation around it uh -huh, uh -huh. and like so like I sent it to my, my my friend my collaborator and then it's just like okay so this is what I have this is the soundtrack like th hopefully this should give you an idea of what I kind of want and and then he sent me something and it was it was beautiful it just didn't work anymore in my mind because I had mm -hmm. just been living with this with this other uh, with this music already, and it's just like oh, sh oh my god, yeah. <laughs> not gonna work. So I promised him I was I was gonna do something else with the soundtrack that like that he that he sent me. Uh, but yeah, so that it was just like it's just weird like when stuff like that happens, and it's just like something I was in unintended. It was unintended. Yeah. Well, but I think it was just like when things work, just like that's kind of what it was. And also like there was supposed to be voice, as you said, like also there was mm -hmm. supposed to be uh, a voiceover as mm -hmm. well. So like all the dialogue that's in like the subtitles was supposed to be a, a voiceover. And then at the same time, just like, like I was thinking about it, like, you know, getting like an actress to record it and just like, just started to pare it down and pare it down. Just like I wanted to, keep it as simple as possible in a way. Like I just like had to like edit a lot of stuff down. Mm -hmm. I had like a very long script and it's just like, I just needed like, just like the like the purest beats, I guess, of that story. So it just was a process of like cutting things down and then just like, it worked like that. But like, I'm, I'm happy that it, you mentioned that it like served as dialogue because it was, that was initially what um, it was going to be. So yeah, it was kind of weird, yeah. but you never it know worked, when it worked out right things go in like weird weird directions but i think that's what i enjoy of this process it's like very unexpected no like, for sure um well thank you so much for for joining us um wow. yeah of course uh right now uh the team for uh abitografia dos um uh, monica miguel and alvaro if they can join us hi hello hello um Welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, how did you decide which types of scenes and little vignettes you wanted to depict? How is that selection process going? And uh, I'm gonna throw in a, a, an audience question with that, which is they're asking if, if this was based on any specific city or uh, in Latin America. Mm. Well, uh, the starting point uh, for these vignettes was, was our memories. Mm -hmm. Our memories of um, living in our own city, Cali. But uh, there are at least other two cities that we, we were trying to depict. Uh, Bogota, here in Colombia too, and Buenos Aires. Because there's, there are, these two cities have, uh, well, we, we have some experiences in, 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 in in these cities too. Um, um, the, the starting point, well, uh, uh, but there, there are other cities uh, 
in the maybe I can take over for a second. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as Miguel says, from the stand view of the drawings and the intaglio that is the uh, background for the film, these are the main like spaces that we try to depict. But the sound. Uh, design has other cities that Alvaro and uh, well has uh, captured and has brought into that construction of that uh, kind of imaginary, if you might, uh, location. Huh? So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily only Latin American. I'm sure it has more of Latin American uh, <laughs> uh, vibes than um, North American, but. Uh, I'm also sure that there's some other places that you can find there in the sound. No, Vado? What do you think? <laughs> Quickly. Quickly. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, just to go back a little bit, like um, the whole short that's mm, very much non-narrative, still very attached to personal experiences and these two, and also from uh, a part of me that live in different places at different times. And so it is how you remember things. So it, uh, we wanted to go for a very detailed uh, layered sound, um, sound design. But um, if you start piling up too many layers, then you get, uh, it's cacophony and we can play with that, but also it's good to have, for example, a walk late at night where there's like the city calm. So yeah. we had very, very long conversations, ongoing conversations for months, uh, deciding how to play with sound and with silence. And uh, it all comes from a very, lived experience mm -hmm. and I think that enriches the both the visual and the sound design and, and that goes as well for the, the question that you were uh, mm -hmm. asking which is where the where does the the actions let's say situations we like to I mean, call them situations more than yeah. actions because it definitely steers away from action um, so the vignettes uh, uh, come from the memories of our of our movement mm -hmm. in a the same movement in the same city in the same way. We just we op our research was mostly to observe intensely the same things we do every single yeah, day. Yeah. And take notes and draw and draw and well draw and draw and, <laughs> uh, and talk as well a lot. But these are things that happen in our lives all the time. The people that walk around is the people that we see, and the yeah. people, and we are there as well as characters. The both of us are there somehow. Yeah. No. This intimacy really, like that you're talking about, really like the short really does feel that way. Um, uh, Alvaro was mentioning uh, that this is very much not a narrative film, uh, but I, I would say that there's still a story that's being told uh, and that comes through. Uh, so wh why do you think uh, animation is, I mean, this is a, a little bit of a broader question, but like it's a perfect way to tell these like more non-traditional stories and you can like explore maybe these, these different types. Why is animation like a good way for doing that? Well, um... Uh, I, I don't think, we, we don't think animation is the best way of, of tell this story of, of to, to make this film. Uh, but we, we found this, this book about uh, post-narrative. Uh, uh, cinema. Cinema, written by Horacio Munoz. And, uh, and we liked it very much. And in this book, he uh, made some th theoretic developments about post-narrative in live action. Um, uh, and we, Monica and, and, and I, we, we draw every time. Mm -hmm. And I am a, an animator. 
And um, then we, we, we think uh, about these, uh, these concepts developed in the post narrative in live action could be translated to some kind of uh, post narrative animation. And so we, we, we started this exploration, this experiment. Yeah. yeah so we, well, we came up with a small little term that was uh, contained animation. Mm -hmm. which oh, that's beautiful. I love that. Kind of, <laughs> it kind of answers to the other traditional type of mm -hmm. animation that you see in, in like mainstream uh, films in which people, animated people, uh, yeah. When they jump, they really jump. And when they do, they really do. And what we wanted to do was really just contrive, like keep it really small. So, and repetitive and tense. Yeah. No, it's, 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 be, it's a beautiful short. And thank you so much for, for being here with us. Um, thank you. And of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, for our final uh, short of the night, I'd love uh, Elvin uh, from La Casita Rosa to, to join us. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, nice to finally meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Um, so I, I'd love to hear, how did you how did you hear about these women, like these amazing women? And and at what point did you say like, okay, I'm gonna approach them like this is a story, story worth telling? Well, in my undergrad, I double majored in filmmaking, but also in Chicana Chicano studies. Mm -hmm. So as I was learning more about my cultural background and learning more, learning more about myself and um, where I came from, um, I started mixing both majors together. I realized that I wanted to become a filmmaker that tells the, these types of stories uh, about social justice. Mm -hmm. And um, I had just gotten my Facebook account and I was like adding all these pages, all these political pages and yeah. uh, nonprofits. And one of them posted a, a video, a video of these women, Las Patronas, um, throwing these, essentially their survival pa um, packages to these um, immigrants that are riding the train, which they call a bestia. Mm -hmm. And um, it just left such an impact as a young filmmaker. But I felt like I wasn't mature enough as a filmmaker to pursue something, to pursue a, a, a film about them in that scale. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until grad school when I was um, brainstorming ideas for, for my thesis that I um, stumbled upon that video again, looking through my, you know how Facebook tells you like, oh, five years ago, you like this. Or you yeah, this. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I forgot. Like, I remember like, I saw this and I was like, wow, these women are doing something extraordinary. So then I realized that I wanted to go to Veracruz and capture and capture what these women were doing and learn more about about them. And at the same time, during grad school, that's when um, there was an election year and immigrants are being negatively stigmatized and it was making me upset. And I'm like, no, I feel like I need to showcase that the reason, go deeper into the reason why these uh, so many people are fleeing Central America and the type of aid they're receiving along the way um, coming here to the US. And um, I outreached to them and they were more than happy to open the doors. They were used to reporters constantly going to Mexico, but mm -hmm. I told them like, I'm not a reporter, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. I wanna make a story about you guys. Yeah. And uh, they were very happy. They, they, they allowed me to stay in their albergue and um, I was there for a week. And to this day, I'm still in touch with them. But the fact that they don't get paid for this, they're complete, they're completely volunteers. Yeah. And the reason they do this is because their their home is close to the train tracks. So daily, like 20, their the organization is over 20 years old. And before that, when more Central Americans were using the trains as a means of of transportation, they would yell at at the neighbors at all of, of to all the, the locals as they were going through all these towns so like hey can you throw us some food or anything you have any scraps mm -hmm. and these women were saying this came, happened to them constantly and they felt bad because they could never offer anything so then they organized themselves and this group of, of, of women to to dedicate their free time in helping out these immigrants because no one else is doing yeah. it no the, their story is amazing like i i I was like that. I didn't know about it. Um, uh, so after this, after you spend the week with them and you kind of like uh, are, have all the, the footage, uh, how, how, uh, how do you as a filmmaker like decide, okay, this is, this is where this, like where I've been telling a story, especially in real life when, when the story keeps going, you know, and, and especially something that, that, that is still so ongoing as, as the immigration and, and, 
that town, I mean, you said it's been going on for five years. How do you decide, okay, this is where my story starts and my story ends as a, as a filmmaker? Essentially, I wanted this to be a, a feature film. Mm -hmm. um, but then since I was there for a week, I only captured a certain amount of footage. And when I got back and I was um, doing rough cuts and um, I was doing all these um, rough cuts and I realized, you know what? It doesn't necessarily need to be a feature film. I think I've captured enough B-roll and interviews to really create something meaningful mm -hmm. and something that really showcases these women, um, what they're doing, like essentially what they're doing to, to the world. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's an act of human kindness. They're doing it out of love, out of faith. And I'm like, that's something beautiful. I feel like I don't necessarily need to make it an hour and a half. I think yeah. 13 minutes, it's short, it's sweet, and it gets to the point. And um, yeah, I feel like I hit every point, every point in the movie, like really strongly, uh, clearly communicates who they are, what they're doing it, it down to their individual like reasoning and, and um, mm -hmm. their philosophical um, reasoning behind it. Some of, the, some of the women are like, oh, it's because of my kids. Oh, because I feel bad because you know, God made me give me, I may be poor and God gave me so much, but I can give so much more if I just, mm -hmm. you know, organize with the community. And um, to answer your question, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it came down to, it just really came down to, um, yeah, this story is going on and I'm still in communication with these women and they're constantly, they're, they're adapting to the new times because less and less immigrants are actually traveling by train now. They mm -hmm. go by foot. Um, but I feel like I was capturing an era, an era that was coming to an end for them because yeah. uh, this whole train system is no longer um, something that's used as widespread for immigrants that are traveling up north. So I feel like I was capturing that that moment where like they were transitioning to what they do now, which is they just open up. They've created this network of other albergues in Mexico mm -hmm. where um, they'd be like, okay, your next stop will be in this state and this town. So you told the immigrants that are going by foot. Like, go this way and you'll get to your next stop versus yeah. they were just waiting for them to come in the train and the reason why the decline of the of, of immigrants using the train is because southern in southern if you go deeper south into mexico there's gangs and the politicians that are actually harassing them not to use the train anymore or asking for like a quota for yeah. them to use it and obviously they're coming with nothing so they can't pay and there's just fear for their lives yeah um uh that's awesome. Well, I, I do think you you attained the perfect uh, uh, what you wanted to do. So thank you for, for coming. Uh, so I think now I'm going to ask everyone to just come back um, for our final uh, question. I don't know if uh, there's been any other uh, audience Q&As or I can just proceed to the final question. If I can just um, get a... Um, Okay, I, I'll just uh, be asking um, uh, a quick question from each of the teams, uh, which is what is the, the next step for you and the film? Like if, if people want to find it somewhere else, can they? Uh, is it in, in storage? Just like what are the next steps for this project? Uh, so uh, Blaise and St. Mueller, if you want to. No, for now we are starting the distribution stage, really. We don't have it online yet. And this is actually the world premiere, so. Oh, wow. How oh, honored we are. Um, uh, flowers, Flowers Within? Same, also premiere and doing more festival runs. Awesome, so stay tuned. Uh, Maria? We are actually going to be at another uh, online film festival soon. We're, we're not allowed yet to say which one, but um, if you check us out on uh, my website, um, you will we'll send the announcement as soon as we can, but we're pretty excited to continue to share the film, whether it's on festivals as we've done so far or this new virtual journey. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Uh, Flesh? Uh, Flesh, uh, so the film will be in, in other uh, festivals like Monstra and Annecy. And maybe afterwards, uh, uh, and uh, we want to do some something like a series. Just this, oh. the same idea. Yeah. Awesome! That would be really cool. Thank you, um, Borrachero. Uh, just a bit of more festival run. 
that's kind of it. And pretty much, I've I already started a bit earlier on, but yeah, that's that's all. <laughs> and see what happens. Yeah. Great. Uh, are we talking about those? Well, we just we just finished the film actually, like what a week ago, something yes. like this. Yes. So this is the premiere as well, and we're just starting the festival run and the distribution uh, legwork. And but we are invited to a film, uh, a festival which is not necessarily a film festival in Manizales, which is called El Festival de la Imagen. They deal with the moving image, mm -hmm. I think, or the image itself. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so yeah, this is the second uh, step, but thank you for having us because this was uh, also our world, world thank premiere. You. That's, that's amazing. Uh, and finally, uh, La Casita Rosa. Um, this is the fourth film festival that it's been accepted to. And thank you so much for Lily for accepting it. Um, and um, it's only been shown here in the US, but I want to premiere it in Mexico to film festivals, festivals over there. Cause I mean, I'm also kind of jealous that all the film festivals that I've gone to here in the US, I see all the directors with their cast and crew in the step and repeat and I would just go by myself. Okay. Um, but I do want to premiere it in Mexico and invite the women to come to the screening and, you know, introduce them. Cause it's really, it's them who put me, who made me a better filmmaker. Um, but documentary filmmaking is my passion. So I want to continue looking out for um, other interesting stories that I can capture. Awesome. Well, thank you all of you for, for joining us. Uh, it was great having to talk to you and and um, and, and see your, your art. Uh, and thank you everyone who watched this. Uh, please stay tuned. We have a great musical performance uh, by Crystal coming, coming up next. So stay tuned. And we still have another week of amazing uh, films and, and programs for you at La Leaf Connect. So just go to uh, latinofilm.org to check everything out. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.